So I was woken in the middle of the night by a thud on the hull of our boat. And when I came up on deck, we found that we were surrounded by pieces of plastic in the ocean. It didn't make any sense. At the time, we were a thousand miles from nearest land. The closest people to us were in the space station in orbit above our heads. And yet, there was this evidence of human life and waste in the water all around us. At this time, I was on a journey around the world on this crazy rocket ship powerboat called Earthrace that ran on 100% biofuel. It was a journey that, for me, began as a way to hitchhike from England to a new job in Australia without taking an aeroplane. But it was this incident in the middle of the ocean that sparked a new career direction for me, sailing the world on a mission to connect people, scientists and communicators, with the ocean, exploring issues all the way from the equator to the poles. Along the way, we would stop at these small islands, and we'd find that the locals were struggling to catch fish because the commercial vessels had emptied their waters. They were struggling to grow food in the ground because that sea level rise had caused their soil to become too salty. The knock-on effect of this was a new reliance on packaged, imported food that all came wrapped up in this new, strange material, plastic. With no system in place for all of this packaging and this waste to go, a lot of it ended up getting thrown on the beach, in the ocean, or otherwise burnt. And it was that burning of plastic, that really toxic smell that kept getting up my nose. And I started to learn about these chemicals, dioxins, that lead to cancer and get absorbed inside our bodies. And so this became my first mission, to eliminate the burning of plastic on these two small islands in Tonga, in the heart of the South Pacific Ocean. On meeting the local community, I realized that it started with a shift in thinking. As I started to learn the Tongan language, I discovered that there wasn't a word for bin. Because up until recently, they hadn't needed to talk about throwing waste away into a controlled system. It simply didn't exist in their culture because organic matter could be thrown on the ground with no consequence. So it was not only infrastructure that these small islands needed, but a whole new way of thinking about this new inorganic material. So after six months of working and teaching with the local community, we culminated in a colossal cleanup event. And together with 3,000 local volunteers, we picked up 56 tons of rubbish in five hours. Now, this amount of waste, it just staggered me. Both what was coming from the local community but also when I walked along the beach every morning and I was seeing plastic washing up, often with writing on it in languages that I didn't even recognize. So this got me asking more questions. Where was that plastic coming from and how was it ending up on this little beach in Tonga? So I started to learn more about plastic itself this terrifyingly large number on the screen right now is how many plastic bags we're using this second. This clock started ticking on the 1st of January, 2018. And those bags, they get used once, maybe twice, probably three times at best, and then they get thrown away. How is it that we are using a material that's designed to last forever for a product like a bag that's designed to be used once 
and then thrown away. It is that mismatch of material science and product design that puts us in this situation of having huge amounts of waste material that no longer has any use or any value. So then I thought, can't we just recycle all that plastic? Can't we turn it back into new things? But it turns out only 9% of the plastic we use actually gets recycled. And that number's so low because plastic is a term we give to hundreds of materials. They have different properties, therefore different chemical structures, and you can only recycle one type of plastic at a time. So this mess needs to be cleaned and sorted, and then you come across something like a toothbrush that's got three or four different types of plastic stuck together into one object, making it completely impossible to recycle. So all this plastic with no place to go, eventually a lot of it finds its way down streams and drains and rivers into the ocean. Everything runs downhill. And from there, it meets ocean currents and makes its way out into these accumulation zones in the middle of each of our oceans, or what we call gyres. And so, for me, this became my next mission, was to go and actually find out more, all of these unanswered questions about these potential gyres out there. And so, we got a, a boat called Sea Dragon together to take people out to sea and find out more about this really unknown issue. We went out searching for these islands of plastic, something we could maybe scoop up and bring home. But when we got out there, we realized it was much smaller than expected. And this plastic doesn't float around in rafts on the surface of the ocean. It photodegrades into tiny fragments, smaller than your little fingernail. So we took a net through the water to take a much closer look. And every time we bring this net out, we find hundreds, thousands of these microplastic and microfiber particles. And we realize that our ocean has become a fine soup of plastic pieces. We crisscrossed our way around the planet, going to every one of these gyres. And it really was the same thing everywhere, both in the middle of these accumulation zones, but also all the way in between, from the tropics to the Arctic. When we get the samples back on board and analyze them, we have to try and distinguish what's plastic and what's plankton. And it amazes me just how hard it is to work out the difference between these two. And it made me wonder, how do the fish cope figuring out what's food and what's plastic? We started catching fish, and we found plastic in the stomachs of those fish as well. So this started opening up new questions. What might the implications be on us as well. If this plastic is getting into the food chain, the same food chain that we are at the top of, then what might that mean? So a few years ago, I decided I wanted to know, is this something that we even need to worry about? And decided to test my own blood for these chemicals that we're finding in the plastic and in the fish in our seas. Working together with the United Nations, we picked 35 chemicals that are banned because they're toxic to humans. And of those 35 chemicals, we found 29 of them inside my body. Now, this really changed things for me. And I think often when we talk about or hear about environmental problems, they're things that are happening somewhere else, affecting somebody else at some point in the future. But this made me realize that actually we all, I'm afraid, already have a body burden, a chemical footprint, something that we'll never get rid of. And at the moment, the levels are not alarmingly high that we need to be immediately concerned about our health. But it's a very scary indicator of the direction that we're heading. So these issues are complex and call for a wide 
range of solutions. There's this really significant moment when after a month at sea, you finally reach land. And for me, the more time I've spent at sea, the more I realize that the solutions start right here on land. Right now, there are over five trillion fragments of plastic floating on the surface of our ocean. There's many times that that have sunk to the depths. We can't even measure them. This makes cleanup a colossal challenge. We, there are many ways that we can tackle this problem, all the way from source to ocean, from product design to waste management. But we need to turn off the tap. We need to work at the source. And this upstream action is required across all sectors of society, designers and industry, policymakers at a government level, and all of us as individual consumers. One of the things that I love about being at sea is that you're constantly having to react to the changes in the environment around you. If the wind picks up or the waves change direction, you have to respond, you have to shift your sails and your course, and often your life depends on that response. Now, we invented these chemicals, these disposable plastics, for really good reasons. We didn't set out to destroy our oceans. It was millions of micro-actions that have got us to where we are today. But now we know. We know the impact that we're having, and we also know the brilliant steps that we can start to take to change it. And so it's time for us to respond. We need to shift our sails, change our course, as if our lives depend on it. Thank you.